Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session of Open Education Champion. Um, OA Champions is a chance to talk to important OA advocates and actors, which is why we're talking to you today, Catherine, as an Open Education Champion. The intent of the session is for students, teachers, pedagogues, and practitioners of open education, like yourself, to discuss the importance of open education and to share experiences with facilitating the creation of more OER to inspire others to do the same. My name is uh, Céline Peña. I'm deputy librarian in Athlone Institute of Technology in Ireland, soon to become Technological University of the Shannon. And I'm very pleased to welcome the dear colleague and dear friend, Dr. Catherine Cronin, to this session. Um, Catherine is an open educator, open researcher, and she is strategic education developer at the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education in Ireland. So Catherine, you're very welcome. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be given the opportunity to interview you for um, this series of interviews. So just to ease yourself gently into it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Celine. Just a bit um, about your work with open educational resources uh, or open pedagogy more broadly. Uh, are you referring to my current work you're yes. you referring to? Yes. So as you said, and, and thanks so much for the invitation to, to join this interview series. I'm delighted and particularly delighted to be speaking with you, Celine. Um, I work with the National Forum uh, here in Ireland for the enhancement of teaching and learning in higher education. And the National Forum, for those who may not know, is a small uh, academically led body um, that works uh, across all higher education institutions in Ireland, um, leading and supporting the enhancement of teaching and learning. So my area of, of work within the forum is around digital and open education. And much of the work, um, I've been with the forum almost three years now. Um, and much of that work has been in the area of open education. Um, and this is why the National Forum from its inception in 2013, um, uh, established that all National Forum funded projects, any resources that were produced within those projects would need to be openly shared, openly licensed and openly shared. So they could be shared across the sector, reused, adapted and so on. Um, but there wasn't a deep and wide understanding of open licensing. So some of those resources were put up on WordPress sites or whatever, but very few of them were actually openly licensed. So when I came into the forum at the end of 2018, that was a big part of my task. Um, so the National Forum has developed a set of resources, but we didn't do that off our own bat. We've done it in collaboration with students and staff. Um, you, are, you are one of those members of staff, Celine. Um, so we, and even before the National Forum embarked on any of the development of resources to support building open capabilities in Irish, Irish education, we met with a group of librarians and teaching and learning professionals and students um, to help us kind of chart the way forward. Because as you know, there are so many questions that can be asked and, and supports that can be provided in the area of open education. And we wanted that to be just targeted at what people needed um, and what particularly librarians, teaching and learning professionals and students felt was needed. So we've developed, um, we've developed uh, the National Forum Open Licensing Toolkit. We've developed a guide to help people choose an appropriate open license for their work. Um, and then along with you, Celine and um, Angelica Rasquez and Claire Macavinia, um, a, a team of four of us developed an online resource for using OER and OAP and teaching and learning. And you know, we aim to support individual students and staff, but also the key people within institutions who are doing that work also. So we see our work as happening at uh, a number of different levels. And it's, it's, it's fantastic to have resources that can actually support all stakeholders and not simply staff who teach and not simply students, but overall, because the need for open education and for OEP is just so broad now. There's, there's yes. so many people who just need to understand how it works, to be able to use it properly and to be able to produce resources mm -hmm. openly and, and, and properly. Um, Catherine, this is your work with the National Forum. Um, you've worked, with, I think, NUIG before, you've worked with universities in the States. So how did you come to be involved uh, in, a, in open education? 
<laughs> it's a great question. Um, it's been a journey, I suppose you could say, of many parts. My background is engineering, uh, mechanical engineering, systems engineering, and I have a master's degree in women's studies. So as you say, I taught for many years at um, the National University of Ireland in Galway, um, taught also with the Open University in Scotland, um, and in community education in Ireland and Scotland, mainly in socially disadvantaged communities. Um, I'm, I'm a New Yorker who has made my home in the west of Ireland, so I think my work has always been uh, somewhat hybrid um, and, and boundary crossing in various ways. You know, I, I, I particularly enjoy helping students and learners who may never have imagined themselves studying at third level to engage with education and inviting university students and third level students to apply what they're learning in the communities that are meaningful to them. So that's kind of my work really broadly. So when I encountered open education for the first time, it was a good fit, the values of open education around access and equity um, and uh, open pedagogy fit very much with the work that I was doing. So I started intentionally using what I would now call open educational practices, probably in around 2009, 2010, shortly after I started using Twitter and connecting with other educators globally. Um, I taught for several years, I taught a second year IT module in the BSc Information Technology at NUI Galway. And I collaborated with educators starting in 2011, educators in Ireland, UK, Germany, New Zealand, um, Spain. And we helped to connect our students. Now, obviously you have different term times and so on, and we had different students and taking different courses in different disciplines, but we were all working to help our students create um, media and openly license digital resources. So through that, we were able to connect our students so students could actually access one another's work, remix it, riff on it. Um, and that was very exciting and just helping students develop those skills. So, so I learned in through that work a lot about the complexities of things like digital identity and privacy. And I found myself speaking often with other educators about, um, about the work of, that, that my students were doing and the work of other people like, you know, Dana Boyd and Bonnie Stewart, I'm thinking people, you know, kind of in the early 20 teens, Martin Weller, Tracy McMillan Cotton, Audrey Waters. And I realized that open couldn't become part of the culture and of an institution unless it's embedded in strategy and policy. So I wanted to, I wanted to do that work. So I started my PhD in 2013. Um, in this area of open educational practices. And I finished that in 2018, and that's the time that I came to work with the National Forum. So I suppose I consider myself, just at base, I consider myself an open educator and open researcher. And you know, the practice informs the research, living in the world informs the research. And I know the title of this series is um, Open Champions, but I often say that I consider myself a critical um, advocate for open. Um, advocating, you know, open knowledge and open institutions, um, but also knowing that, you know, as I found in my research, that openness is always complex, personal, contextual, and continually negotiated. Very good, Catherine. I suppose we could rename the session OE Champion and OE Critical Thinker. Critical Advocate. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I mean, listening to you, Catherine, really, I mean, just fantastic to hear the mention of other countries and often other OE champions and other OE researchers um, all over the world. And it, it's really something that's striking that open education and OEP suddenly just burst all those, those barriers, um, the, the collaborative um, opportunities you're getting through um, open education is just phenomenal. You know? um, and as you said, yeah. equity of access, fairness of access, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's um, quite empowering to, to hear all that and, and to see how you've progressed from trying to applying it and now just leading and uh, the living example that it's, it's doable and, and we have to keep working on this and, and again, using the past that you've laid so far. Um, Catherine, I mean, I suppose I would nearly answer the question myself, but have librarians supported you on that open education journey? Absolutely, Celine, and um, yeah, and I would just say that that whole concept that you that you referred to in your response there, just about the concept of the commons. You know, I, I mean, I only 
found myself thinking that some things were possible from seeing what other people were trying. And those other people may not even have been in higher education. Some of them were in primary level education and second level education in other countries. So that whole notion of the commons um, was the light that went off for me. So I was learning from taking part in some of the early MOOCs and seeing what people were sharing on Twitter. And then I tried things and then I realized, well, you know, I learned from other people sharing, so I need to share my own work. And, you know, that just that cycle um, goes on. And librarians were a big piece of that. So, you know, obviously librarians here in Ireland, you know, like yourself, like, you know, the Institute librarian at NUI Galway, who, you know, really understands and has understood for some time the importance of not just open access, but linking open access with open educational resources. Um, Because these are often two different domains, you know, open science and open teaching and learning. Um, And, you know, just the the skills and the knowledge that librarians have around, um, you know, information literacies, media literacies, digital literacies, um, copyright, licensing, you know, navigating, uh, you know, a wealth of information. That's, That's all the bedrock you know, of, of open educational practices. So the most exciting and, and productive and successful initiatives are often, you know, where, where librarians are working in partnership with students, teaching and learning professionals, you know, um, people who are teaching, you know, in various disciplines. And you know, I, I, I observe that happening in other countries, you know, I've seen it happening in Canada and the US and South Africa and the UK, and it's happening very much in Ireland now as well. Um, and you know, I only applaud it, and you know, so excited to just be be a part of it, really. Yeah, and I suppose it, you know, it is essential that librarians are part of the open education journey. And there's no question. Um, I just find we, for our students and for our colleagues, we are kind of the gate. Um, we are helping people to reach out to open education and to reach out to resources. Um, we do have the extra little skills to be able to organize and curate these. Um, and I, th- I think that's the key, really. Um, we're here to make sure that users, current users and potential, potential users are not overwhelmed. Yeah. You know, and I, I think it's, it's, um, it's fantastic to be able to um, collaborate with people creating, to create OERs ourselves as, as well. Um, you've mentioned information literacy and, and digital mm-hmm. literacy. Uh, there's a lot of work being there, uh, being done there uh, as well. So yeah, one couldn't happen without the other. Um, you know, and, I, and I think librarians are kind of moving simply from looking at OER as new and, and open education as new mm-hmm. um, part of collection development. Um, I think we have all have embraced this concept of equity and access mm-hmm. and fairness, um, and it is having a huge impact on how librarians are rethinking collection development. Um, you know, so that's, it's, that's, that's yeah. wonderful. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. And yeah, yeah, I think that's, you just really touched on what I feel is kind of a key area of our work, our collective work as, you know, critical advocates and champions, and that is um, absolutely to, to introduce people to OER and open licensing and understanding you know the, those those building blocks but not to stop there you know just to to keep looking and, and as you say you know around issues around access and diversity and inclusion within learning materials and students as partners in developing open resources so so you know absolutely to do the building blocks around open licensing and open textbooks but not to stop there what we can do and who benefits you know, when, when we make open education larger than, than just those few things. Um, Catherine, who would you say has benefited the most um, from open education? Uh, and not simply within your institution or your previous work, just generally speaking, who would you say? Well, I mean, we often, as you know, Celine, we, we often talk about three pillars, you know, about, you know, increasing access, um, enhancing equity, um, and, and improving or enhancing pedagogy. And so access and equity, 
you know, we really have to start there. And, you know, we often talk about that in the macro view, access for students, um, you know, for to let's say open textbooks or open resources, but what students will really benefit, you know, from, from um, open, open educational resources and open textbooks. Um, we really generally are helping the most marginalized students, the students who may fall out of the system um, due to high costs, um, due to maybe taking a break in their study um, because they can't afford to, to, to study the, a particular program all in one go, losing access to institutional resources, losing access to their email, losing access to perhaps, you know, pu publisher access to textbooks and so on. So, you know, it's something that's really been reawakened, I think, in the time of, of COVID-19, of the pandemic. You know, I, I think we're all involved in these discussions in our institutions and organizations. And, you know, as I have said before, whatever any of us may have understood about inequality before March 2020, we know a lot more now, you know, about, again, within our institutions and organizations and also globally. So how can we not think about um, what we're doing, particularly if we work in publicly funded institutions um, and opening the work that we do so that students can access it. Yes, potential students, staff, um, and the communities that we live in and obviously wider communities. And then, you know, as I say, pushing the boundaries of open and understanding open, it isn't then just about sharing what we make and what we do, um, but about seeing and learning from what others are sharing and particularly on a global basis. So not just, you know, elite institutions in the global North sharing what we do with the world, um, but what are others, you know, what are other students, other scholars, um, other citizens producing and sharing openly elsewhere that can expand our understanding of the problems that we all face, you know, of the world, of our disciplines. Um, and that's really, um, I think, where the, where the power of open comes in. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're not necessarily simply looking at opening resources and opening knowledge from kind of a more financial uh, part. We're, we're looking at opening the minds by providing um, was an open door to other ways of thinking and other way of, of doing and sharing and collaborating to make things better. So. Yes, yes. Yeah, so, you know, um, you see a lot of documents talking about the knowledge economy. That's what you're talking about. And let's let's think larger about a knowledge society, you know, globally. Yeah. Um, you probably already answered the question, but how do you see, so what do you see as the key successes in open education movement so far, so mm -hmm. far. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was there were talk and reports for years around the awareness of OER uh, among staff and students in higher education. And it just crept up for such a long time. And, you know, many people would say, oh, it's only, you know, only 9% of, of, you know, of higher education, um, you know, staff who teach, you know, know about open educational resources, only 12% or whatever. But through the work of, you know, amazing work of, you know, UNESCO, Creative Commons, open education champions and critical advocates globally over the last 20 years, I think that's really changing. I think we are reaching a critical mass where, you know, when you say OER, oh, someone doesn't say, you know, what's that? And again, the experience of the last 18 months has facilitated many of those conversations in terms of the benefits of, of OER and OEP in this particular time um, that we're living in. So I often, I often link this to other movements for social change, like you know, civil rights and women's rights and LGBTQ rights in that when you're living in a time of change, sometimes it seems like there's a lot of disparate things going on and sometimes people disagree about the way to go forward. Um, someone wants to make legal, thinks legal change is the most important thing. Someone thinks marching in the streets is the most important thing. Someone thinks, you know, making things free is the most important thing. Um, however, uh, there's a set of values that are shared among most people who are working in open education. And I see now the collective progress that that is that that is um facilitating and so it just drives you know i think for a lot of us it just drives us to keep keep going um but again you know even five years ago 
I would have said that all institutions in Ireland had open access policies. Um, no one had an OER policy, um, but now people are talking about, ah, we, we have, we have um, expertise and infrastructure around open in our institutions. How can we leverage that you know, to facilitate OER and OEP within our institutions because the benefits are more understood? So I, I think we've made a lot of progress, but obviously still much more to do. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely, um, Catherine, I must say, I'm a, I can see it myself on the ground, all the work that has been done in, in the last few years when librarians now try to introduce more, um, I suppose, OER and concept of OEP, we are not with being faced with the same barriers or, or the same challenges. There's an awareness already, um, and there's definitely a huge change in the willingness to engage with it. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it is so obvious on, on the ground now. And uh, you know the ability to collaborate with colleagues and to collaborate um, with students, it's, it's, this is one of the big wins. You know? um, I haven't heard, why should I be sharing my work in a long, long time? And I would have been you know, the usual Uber, mm -hmm. why? Uh, it's not there now, I think. The understanding and the acceptance that, that you know this is the way forward for all of us and that we'll all benefit from it um, as you said it's, it's huge changing changes in the last few years but definitely um in the last 18 months and that's quite phenomenal so very very uh, encouraging uh, for everybody um now this is how far we've we've come um what do you think still needs to be done for open education to Truly, truly, truly take hold. Mm -hmm. What's left to be done? How, how can we um, keep pushing? Yeah. Um, you know, as much as we agree that things are further ahead now than they were, you know, what the challenges that we all face are also growing at the same time, aren't they? I mean, obviously, the pandemic, climate change, um, rising inequality around the world, rising authoritarianism surveillance capitalism, all of the challenges within higher education itself. Um, so I think the key is to keep reminding ourselves about how we can, how we can work from the values of, the, you know, like the conceptual foundations of openness. So the values of sharing, participation, co-creation, partnership, uh, the value of knowledge as a public good, um, the knowledge society concept that, that, that I was just talking about, um, the ethics of care and justice, as, as Audrey Waters says. So the most pressing challenge is to keep the large view, I think, you know, to keep reassessing what we're doing. You know, are we working to reach these larger goals? Um, how can we do it better? How can we meet the needs, particularly of, of those who are marginalized because people are becoming marginalized in new and different ways all the time. So yes, focus on licensing, focus on open textbooks, absolutely, but help people connect to the why and, the, and these larger values of open. And, and I think probably that's our most important work. So uh, what does that mean in practice? Uh, I've mentioned it already, but I think recognize the importance of strategy and policy uh, to embed um, and facilitate these practices within institutions, you know, within higher education, you know, even as a sector. So I, I found, for example, in my research, that the lack of policy in any particular area speaks really loudly to people. So a lack of an OER policy means that you will always have a few people who, you know, who will, you know, be engage in OER and share OER or whatever. But, you know, there will be a bulk of people who will say, well, I don't really think that's you know, that's enabled by the institution. And what if something goes wrong? And I don't really know what license to you, you know, all, all the host of questions. So if we want to embed a culture of openness in our institutions, address it, at, you know, in mission statements and the strategy of the institution, the teaching and learning strategy and in policies. I think that's really important. Uh, reward the use of OER and OEP in promotion criteria, uh, listen to students. Um, you know, those are just a few of the ways. I mean, that's those are avenues that I see certainly for, for my future work. But, um, you know, just continually listening, continually asking how we can do better to meet the challenges because they're changing all the time. You know, working from these values, um, these collective values 
um, of openness. Yeah, absolutely. The, as you said, keep working on, on the why and, and getting to a base level where we all understand um, the why, the, the policy makers and, and strategizing. It's very important. Um, I'd say some key part there for me would be also this, this reassurance because the, you know, the, the OE champions can see the need for policies. Mm -hmm. we do have to convince at higher levels that this is the way forward. So there's still a lot of reassuring to be done and reinforcing the benefits of, of, of OEP and, and of OER. Um, I suppose the, the fact as well that the quality of widely available OER out there is now completely ascertain. Um, we know that we are getting is, is good things that those resources can be used um, as proper teaching material as well. And that's, that reassurance has, has to be there. Yes, I can agree. Get and the, one the of the advantages library. of um, open education becoming more mature is that there are you know, exemplars, examples of practice and the way this works in different kinds of institutions and in different kinds of contexts that are, that are there, that are out there, that are openly published, that we know about you know, through our work in open education that we can share with people to help you know, to help bring people along. So, you know, again, that's one of the things that's, that's you know, much further down the road than, than, you know, a few years ago. So we can use that, you know, we can use the good practice of our colleagues in other places, you know, to help move things forward. Absolutely. In our Absolutely. own, in our own context. Yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of institutions and a lot of, of organizations have demonstrated that it, it works and it's, it's the way forward. So we are fortunate to have institution organization and champions like you to guide us mm -hmm. and um, and learn from um Catherine what are your own plans for the future of open education <laughs> yes uh, well you know always thinking obviously um I have some plans my my the, the way the national forum works is most people come for a period of time you know there's a small core staff in the national forum and then people come in on secondment so this is constant refreshing of people coming into the forum working with the forum and then going back out to work in institutions or organizations elsewhere so my three-year term with the national forum is coming to an end at the end of december and you know, I mean, I've worked with you, Celine, on, on our big OER, OEP project. I mean, it's truly been some of the most rewarding work that I've done um, in digital and open education, you know, just being able to work, you know, on a, on a national level, you know, collaborating with people, you know, across institutions. It's been wonderful. Um, so I'm working on specific plans for 2022 and beyond, and I'm not going to be going back within an institution. I'm partnering with um, another friend and scholar of open education and higher education on a research and writing project. Um, I'm going to be doing some more community focused work about, um, you know, I, I just see a huge need for open education in, in, in specific communities, um, again, marginalized communities here in Ireland. Um, and I'd like to do some of that work, part, again, partnering with, with people to facilitate that. And then kind of leaving a little bit of space just to imagine um, you know, what, what else might be done. So I'm, I'm really excited um, just about the next phase. So it'll be all the National Forum for the next few months. Um, and then, yeah, and then a few new projects. Wow. <laughs> that was an exclusive news. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, look at it. I mean, your work with the National Forum has been um, absolutely phenomenal and has brought forward the Irish higher education sector on the open education practice journey. Um, I, again, I'm just I'm gobsmacked. Um, I'm delighted that you've been moving on and concentrating on more really pressing challenges, as you said, for some communities on, on, the, on the margin. Um, uh, it's um, it was a logical way to kind of apply um all all the work the research the experience that you have accumulated over, over the last few years um is there anything else you'd like to add well um i will say that um the last two uh work moves that i made one of the most remarkable things i found was that 
they weren't as um, cataclysmic as some moves I'd made earlier in my career because working in open education, our networks are global. So, you know, you, you work in one institution, you may work, go to work for another institution or organization or elsewhere, and your network actually, you know, moves with you. So um, that's, very, that's a very comforting and satisfying thing. because I, So I know I'll be liaising and working with, you know, many, many of the wonderful people I'm, I'm working with and collaborating with right now. Um, and it's also why I suppose once, once you realize that, it's another reason why I feel open educational practices are so important to model and help students to develop. Because, you know, one of the most important things I think for students to bring from, you know, from their institutions um, is not just their qualification, um, degree, diploma, or whatever it may be, but just an understanding of how to um, engage in different um, digital and open ecosystems, because they will encounter them in, in their work, whether, whether they're a social worker or a lawyer or an IT professional or whatever, and even just to start developing some of those networks. So they take those with them outside institutions. And I think that's a real obligation of higher education at this time, you know, in, in living in this increasingly, you know, networked and participatory culture that we live in. So it's, you know, it's one of the joys of my life, but I also, you know, I try and share that and embed that, you know, in my own teaching. So, so look forward to working together again, Celine. <laughs> well, I mean, absolutely. And uh, I'd say, you know, going forward, Catherine, and with the plans you have once you leave the National Forum, I'm sure there will be librarians there. Mm -hmm. um, again, um, helping the communities you'd be working with, mm -hmm. accessing um, the likes of OER, benefiting from open education, um, not simply academic libraries. I mean, public libraries, yeah. any kind of charity libraries, mm -hmm. there will be, I'm sure, librarians and colleagues there um, to support you in your work. And I'll be very happy to support you if I can <laughs> again. Um, so look at me, it looks like we've come to an end to our interview. Um, an absolute pleasure to discuss all that and we could talk all day. <laughs> uh, so thanks again for being here for this great conversation. Um, and we're all really looking forward to sharing this interview with our Open Education Committee. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you so much, Celine. Thank you. Bye.